All right, hello. So this is uh, effectively our fourth screencast on partial molar properties. Uh, and in this particular screencast, we'll work out uh, the gibbs duhem equation. But we're going to start with uh, everything that we've done in our previous three screencasts. So if you haven't watched them yet, uh, go ahead and, and watch them. And so what we're going to take advantage of here is you know our term one and term two from our um, last video. So term one just being our differential for f, my molar f, we said was df dt a constant p and x dt plus df dp a constant t and x dp plus sum over i f bar i dx i. And then term two was our f is equal to sum over i x i f bar i. Okay, so here is where we are going to pick up. Okay, so in our Gibbs Duhem equation. Okay, what I'm going to mess with is, okay, let me write term two. I'm going to mess with term two. Okay, so from term two, we have that f is equal to the sum over i xi um, f bar i. Okay, so again, if this were a binary system, you know, this would be f is equal to x1. Um, f bar 1 plus x2 f bar 2. Okay, cool. Now, if I wanted to, from this expression, right, or from these expressions, I could work out an expression for the differential of f. Okay, so it must be then that the differential of f, okay, would be equal to the differential of x1 f bar 1 plus the differential of x2 f bar 2, okay, so the differential of f would be, so product rule, um, x1 df bar 1 plus f bar 1 dx1 plus x2 df bar 2 plus f bar 2 dx2. Okay, cool. Okay. Or equivalently, if I come over here, okay, I could generalize this then as df, okay, is equal to using product rule, um, sum over i xi d f bar i plus sum over i um, f bar i dxi, okay. So this right would be equivalent to this for the case of a binary system. Okay, cool. So if it's the case that df, okay, is equal to this, okay, and now I'm going to go back to term one, okay, because in term one, we had found that df was given by this. So it must be that this expression for df is consistent with the expression for df we just worked out. Okay. So it must be that, okay, looking at the general case, the sum over i xi df bar i plus sum over i f bar i dx i is equal to, okay, term one was uh, if my memory is correct, df dt, a constant p and x uh, dt, plus df dp, a constant t and x uh, dp, plus, okay, I'm just going to peek back real quick, make sure I've got term 1 right, uh, plus sum over i, f bar i, dx i, plus sum over i, uh, x bar i, df bar i. Okay, and again, let me make sure I have this right before I mess something up. Uh, f bar i, dx i. Okay, sorry. So f bar i, dx i. Okay, cool. Okay, so it must be then that this expression that we just worked out for the differential of f it's equivalent to our expression for the differential of f, right, our, our term 1. Okay, cool. Okay, now let's look at these two equations, right? The first thing I'm going to notice is here I have a sum over i, um, f bar i dx i, 
over here I have a sum over i, f bar i, dx i. So these two terms would cancel each other out. Okay, and so if I bring, say, this term over to the left, or bring these two over to, or bring that over to the right, or these two terms over to the left, doesn't matter. Let me bring these two terms over. Um, well, I, it, it really doesn't matter, right? So uh, let's bring this over to the right. <laughs> so it must be then that I have df dt, a constant p and x, dt plus df dp, a constant t and x, dp minus sum over i xi df bar i is equal to zero. Okay, this expression, this very important expression, is what's known as the Gibbs Duhem equation. Okay, it's often called our zero sum requirement. It's our thermodynamic consistency requirement. Okay, it's our thermodynamically consistent thermodynamic consistency requirement, okay? So uh, partial f, partial t at constant p and x dt plus partial f, partial p at constant t and x dp minus sum over i, xi, df bar i is equal to zero, okay? How we typically see the gibbs Duhem equation or the more common form that you see is at constant temperature and pressure. So if we have constant t and p, constant t and p would tell us that dt and dp is equal to zero. Okay, So this is the general form of the gibbs Duhem equation, but if temperature and pressure are constant, these two terms go away, and we're just left with the sum over i, xi, df bar i is equal to zero. Okay, Cool. So this is the form of the gibbs Duhem equation that you most more typically see. Okay. What the heck does this mean? What is the significance of this equation? Well, the significance of this is, it, it tells us that our partial molar properties aren't independent of each other. They're coupled to each other. They're related. So the change in, you know, F bar, uh, or so if it's a binary system, so um, partial molar F of component one isn't independent of partial molar F of component two, right? Uh, Though changes in our partial molar properties are related. They're coupled. Okay, um, and so to give you an idea of say how you would use this equation, is let's consider a binary system. All right, so if I had a binary system, whoop. so if I had a binary system, okay, composed of uh, components one and two, okay, this then would I could rewrite as x one uh, df bar one plus x two df bar two, okay, is equal to zero or x1 df bar 1 is equal to negative x2 df bar 2. Okay, So again, right, it's telling us that the differentials of our partial molar properties or the changes in our partial molar properties aren't independent of each other. They're, they're related, right? They're related to each other, right? This is really cool. At least I think so. Okay, Now, typically it's, you know, it's harder to, to picture, uh, you know, changes in, um, you know, these the differentials of our, our partial molar properties, uh, and so what's typically you know more common is to look at it in the form of a differential. Okay, so uh, the scenario I want to look at is I have a binary mixture of component one and two. I'm going to uh, add, uh, you know, moles of component two dropwise. All right, so I'm going to change the composition. So I want to look at how these vary and going, say, from an x1 of 0 all the way up to an x1 of 1, right, as I change the mole fraction of component 1. And so how I'm going to get that out of here is let's divide through, uh, let's divide our differentials through by uh, dx1. So if I do that, okay, I could equivalently write this as, you know, x1 df bar 1 dx1 is equal to negative x2 df bar 2 dx1, right? So now, right, x1's mole fraction of component 1, right? And, you know, if I wanted to, okay, even to take this further, okay, I know that uh, uh, 1 is equal to x1 plus x2. So negative x2 would just be, what, um, x1 minus 1 if I wanted to, right? But if I keep it as x2, okay, what this is telling me is if I were to measure f bar 1 and f bar 2 as a function of composition, as a function of x1, Okay, 
So if I were to measure f bar 1 and f bar 2 as a function of composition, right, as a function of composition of my mixture, okay, what this tells me is that df bar 1 dx1 I can relate directly to df bar 2 dx1, okay. So the change of f bar 1 with respect to composition is coupled, is related to the change in f bar 2 with respect to composition, right. They're related. They are coupled to each other. Okay, so our partial molar property and the change in our partial molar property um, of our two components aren't independent, they are related, they are coupled to each other. And this should make sense, right? We said that a partial molar property is essentially the effective value um, for, say, component I in my mixture, right? Um, and you know, what, what changes case compared to pure components is that a pure component, you know, one just interacts with one, a binary mixture of component one and two. Now I have one interacting with one, two interacting with two, but now I have one interacting with, with two, right? And so that cross interaction, right, is going to cause my effective value of the mixture to be different than the pure component value, right? And so it should make sense then that this, these two effective values are, are going to be related or that departure from that, uh, you know, idealized state. Here it is, right, as given by the gibbs duhem equation, uh, you know, this coupling, in this relationship. And so where the gibbs duhem equation becomes incredibly important is later on when we deal with modeling uh, non-ideality in liquid phases, okay, or where it comes up a lot, um, is if I model, say, the um, activity coefficient of, you know, if I have a binary mixture and, you know, I can calculate or measure, say, activity coefficient of component one um, in a system. Uh, well, activity coefficient, log activity coefficient is just going to be my partial molar excess gibbs free energy. So what this tells us is if, say, we were to measure activity coefficient of component 1 and component 2, um, you know, those two properties, that they must conform to the gibbs 2 m equation, right? This equation must be obeyed at constant T and P. If my data that I collect doesn't conform to the gibbs 2 m equation, well then, something's either wrong with my experimental equipment, some, my experimental procedure is flawed, something's wrong with that data, it should not be trusted, it should be thrown out. Also, it gives us then a basis in which we can construct models, right, to model our data. So if I'm trying to, say again, model uh, activity coefficients, and I measure gamma 1 of component 1, it's tempting, say, Microsoft Excel just to fit, you know, polynomial of more and more terms, right? Well, that's not uh, quite going to cut it because, you know, what we'd end up finding is if I fit these big polynomials for, say, gamma 1, um, that it's not going to conform to the gibbs duhem equation, right, that some of those lower order terms are going to have to go away. Like the first term I can include is uh, of the order x squared, okay? So, you know, right now you might not quite see the importance, okay, but the gibbs duhem equation is incredibly important. The big takeaway from right now is what this tells us is that our partial molar properties and the change in our partial molar properties are not independent, they are coupled to each other, okay? Our partial molar property is the effective value of component, uh, property, you know, f of component i in my mixture, right, due to the presence of these cross interactions, so it should make sense that they're coupled, okay? So our partial molar properties and the change in our partial molar properties aren't independent, they are coupled, and it's given by this guy, the gibbs duhem equation. This is the case at constant T and P, which is what we generally see, uh, but in general, right, this equation must be true, okay? gibbs duhem equation, one of the most important equations in, uh, you know, phase equilibrium thermodynamics, and just think you could <laughs> go back and derive it all from our combined statement of the first and second law extended to open systems, okay? Cool. Um, I guess my last comment I'd want to make about gibbs duhem is, you know, we just derived this incredibly important uh, expression, uh, and it may seem very crazy to you, right? Essentially, all we started with was taking... Um, you know, working out expression for the differential of f total with independent variables tp and moles of species i, playing some mathematical tricks, uh, looking at some consistency you know, requirements and, and getting to this guy. Um, and so part of the difficulty of this is if you, if I just asked you out of thin air, you know, show that this is true, you might have a really hard time, you know, getting there, okay? And so don't be discouraged. Uh, don't be afraid, right? How we kind of got there in these four screencasts and made this look, you know, easy for lack of a better word is because, well, you do the natural direction of, of how to get there, okay? And so I guided you there, okay? Um, the big takeaway, though, is knowing where this equation comes from and its usefulness.